Let's go ahead this morning. We're going to open um, God's Word, Psalm 27. Let's all stand together this morning, Psalm chapter 27. We're going to read our scripture and have our call to worship. I love this psalm. We chose this earlier in the week, not knowing what the week would entail, but it's such a, a great psalm of David as he was facing um, some uncertain times. I'll read verse 1. You read verse 2. We'll finish on verse number 6 together. David said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock, all together on verse number six. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Pastor Chris, would you pray for us this morning? Thank you, Heavenly Father, for another Sunday that we can come together to worship you. Help us get our minds and our hearts on worshiping you this morning. Let nothing else come in the way of doing that so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us in every way in our services today, in our music and our message. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we're going to start out with a song. We sang this when our missionary was here, Russ Turner. This is a great song by Bill Gaither. He wrote this, I believe, back in the 60s. It's called I Will Serve Thee, and it's just a testament to what a Christian, their life mission is, serving the Lord. And let's sing about that together.
seems life's the tallest of mountains and it seems you can never reach the top and the road just sink to go on forever disappointments and heartaches never stop Someone to share all your sorrow. If you're not, he will open the door. So open your heart, open your heart, open your mind, open your mind. He
your Bibles this morning. Uh, we're going to be turning over to several passages if we can get to this. So er earlier in the week, I was going back through some old notes, and I don't think I've, I've ever done this. And it's something that the week has just been, this morning's just a small snippet of kind of how the whole week has been. We had a funeral here on, I think it was Thursday, if I'm remembering correctly. I think it was Thursday. And then all in between, um, there's just been some craziness and I know all of us have that so I started going back through some things and then I've been out of the office um, at the hospital or at people's homes more than I and or here at the church even more than I've been here at the church and so as I'm just thinking back on what the Lord would have me to bring uh, to speak on today I just kept thinking about this one thought and this is something that it was night in fact I have my notes it was 1996 um, I was just graduated from Bible college. I was a youth pastor. I was in Atlanta, Georgia. And, um, and the Lord really, I guess, put me in a, in a church, in a position, in a place where I had a lot of learning. I had a lot of things that I had to hit the ground running. And I think all of us, when we go to our first job, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to, I won't, maybe rookie things that you have to do. And 
as a young man coming into ministry, I was 23 years old, had just, gra- just had turned 23, graduated Bible college, started at this church in Atlanta. And while there, I had a breakdown with my car in Atlanta. If, and this was in the 90s. So you don't want to break down anywhere. You definitely don't want to break down in Atlanta. You just want to avoid it at all costs. If you have to go through it, get through it at all costs. Don't break down in Atlanta. Um, but I, I served at this church, and, and so this little car that I had when I was in college, my dad uh, had a car. I had a car that I could have taken with me. I didn't take it my freshman year, thankfully, um, the first semester. The second semester, when I went back to school, my dad said, you can take it. It was a Mustang, and it, it was a nice one, but I think my dad wanted to keep it at home that first semester. He probably drove around. He, he broke it. He's the one that did it. When I took it the second semester, I remember... When I took it, um, it broke down on me somewhere between Jacksonville on I-10 going up to Valdosta. So my youth pastor, I, I went to college in Jacksonville. My youth pastor was speaking in Valdosta at a church, and I got permission to go up after classes on a Wednesday to go hear him speak for a couple of days. And so I remember going up to see him, and it was around Jasper, somewhere around there. Now, some of you probably remember. Now, again, I'm from the Carolinas, but going to college in Jacksonville back then, four years, I didn't travel on 75 much. Back in the 80s, we lived for a short stint in Valdosta, just for a little bit. So I know a little bit about that area. But where I broke down, there was one little box that you, like a call box on the road, something I remember driving that evening. It was dark, heading to Valdosta. I was on 75, and then I heard a clunk. And I'm like, a clunk is never good anywhere, whether you're here on 21 or 75, a clunk. And then within a minute, the car started slowing down. I'm like, this is not good. And again, I'm by myself. I'm at this time, I'm I'm probably 20 years old, maybe. Um, And as I'm driving and I pull it over to the curb on the edge, the the lights just start, you know, I put my, my hazards on and then it just slowly stops. Everything just dies. And I'm like, great, there's the call box. I went over to it. No cell phones back then, not even a beep or any of that stuff. So I Went over and I just hit the button. Now they were expecting me, but my youth pastor, I mean, my youth pastor knew I was coming, but who knew I was going to get there? And I hit the button. I sat. In fact, I was looking at my notes because while I was out there and even after that, I was, you know, with the little light that I had, I was just, you know, trying to think, you know, how long will I be here? Will I survive on 75 close to Jasper? I didn't know where I was. Um, Two hours later, here comes a tow truck. Everything's dead. They, they know the marker where I'm at, I told them. And they took me back to this little fireworks pecan stand. I, I don't know, depending on where you're from, what you call them pecans, pecans, pecans. You put your little pinky up there, pecans, uh, pecans. Um, and they took me back to this little fireworks pecan makeshift chapel gas station. It was before Bucky's was a thing. I've seen this play out before, and it was a horror movie, and you know, you pull in and there's the music, it's dark, and the the Mustang's on the back of the tow truck. I'm riding in the tow truck with a couple of guys, and I'm like, how we doing? You know, and again, I'm I'm a college student, I'm in Bible college, I'm 20 years old, it's probably not a good thing. And it's, at this time, it was about midnight. I'm like, good, night in the morning, this is, so I get into, I, I don't even, I can't remember the name, I've got it somewhere in my notes. Um, and brothers, whatever his name was, he, he, he had a mullet, but was bald here. So the mullet here and, and the cowboy hat, I only knew that because when he took his hat off, he was bald with the mullet. I'm like, that's impressive. Um, and there was a chapel back there where they had church and truckers would come in and you want something to drink. And, you know, they had, it looked like the, you could have different type of thing, whether it's gator tail or rattlesnake, or there was all kinds of interesting things there. In the chapel, there was this huge mural painted like, where am I at? And, um, and even in my notes, I was writing down some of the things after recalling, because I'm like, no one's ever going to believe this. Probably why I've never shared this before. Um, but I was there until my friend, his name is Jason. He actually lives in Valdosta. I met him back in the 80s when my dad took a position at a church there, and we became very fast friends, still friends today. And he lives there still. And he, I had called him from the payphone, 
and said, I'm, I need, I'm stuck. I'm at this place. It's like, oh, I know where that's at. I'll be there. I said, quick, get here quick. I don't know if they're going like, to anoint me with oil or if I'm going to speak in time. I don't know what's going to, I don't want them to bring the snakes out. So please get here. Two hours later, and Jason shows up, and again, who knows what he was doing, and he picked me up, and the next day I went with my youth pastor after I got back, stayed with Jason, and my car, the one that I brought to college that um, was supposed to be the one to carry me here and there into my job, and it broke down. Um, the guy at the junkyard where they took it with my youth pastor, I still remember standing at the counter, he said, it's going nowhere. He said, so I don't know what to tell you. And I'm like, how am I getting back to college? That's all I want to know. And don't call Mr. Mullet because I don't want to go back to Jasper. I just, I know I have to go through there to get back. So what do I need to do? And uh, that whole lesson, that breakdown, I'd never really with my family, maybe some of you have experienced vehicle breakdowns. You, of course, we've all experienced things in our home that have broken down, an oven, a stove, a fridge, um, the AC, or in Florida, for goodness sake, all kinds of things, the TV, everything is broken down. But with that, it, it just caused me to reflect a little bit. Of course, I had a couple more years of college, took this church, went to live in Atlanta. The car that my dad got me was from Mount Airy. It was a little two-door blue car, Toyota Tercel, 1980. He got it from this little widow lady in Mount Airy, um, and he paid $300 for it. I remember he, that's his claim to fame. I found this car, and it came through the Winston-Salem Rescue Mission. because We lived uh, right outside of Winston-Salem around Mount Airy. And so I got this car. It was the ugliest thing you've ever seen. But, Claire, was it not the best car ever? 60,000 miles on this sucker. It was ugly as all get out. It, it, she had parked it under the tree, almost like Mrs. Mendelbright from um, the Andy Griffith Show, where she only drove it to church on Sunday. That's all it was. But that's what she said to my dad. And that car had a soul, had life. That thing was, you could not kill it. It was the best thing ever. Ugliest thing to look at, best car ever. And when I got through with college and we were moving uh, to New England, Claire and I got married, I eventually gave that to my little brother. Biggest mistake ever. I just said, you take it to college. It's been good with me. You, you take it, take it, you use it. And uh, it was great. But that car, when I moved to Atlanta, it broke down in Atlanta. Now, all it ended up being was a hose, as I was on the side of the road looking at it, I'm like, what in the world? It was like things coming out. And uh, it, it, was, it seemed like something that had split in one of the hoses. Something was keeping it from running. So I, like any cheap um, post-college student, right in ministry, young, 23-year-old, engaged to be married in the middle of Atlanta traffic, I had some, some black tape. So I just went to work right there on the side of the road. I'm like, this will do it. And I, I pulled that sucker off and I just like wrapped it. I mean, it was hot. I had to wait on the side of the road. It wasn't the mullet guy came, nobody. I could have called him. He would have been there for me. Um, but I wrapped that thing up and I popped it back on. I tried to put the clamps on it and just wait a little bit, start it. And, and you know, for a while it worked perfectly and it was great. And um, again, that vehicle, not even a year later, my wife and I moved to New England. We, we got us a, a little Toyota Corolla, gave that car to my brother, probably still with the, the tape on it. Um, but those two times, in my mind, even though there have been other times where physically with a vehicle, we've had a flat tire, we've had something, we've hit something on the road and we've had to stop. It, it really, in my mind, has taken me back to what the Lord taught me as something unexpected came into my life, something that I was not planning for, something I was not necessarily prepared for, something I really didn't want to do, but you have to do. There's nothing else you can do. So as we talk this morning, I just want to give you three breakdowns that I think are critical breakdowns in life and why only Jesus can help. And, and for me, you know, I'm looking back on my notes from being a, a 20 year old, a 23 year old kid looking at this. And here I am now, I'm over 50 years old. And I've been, we've been here about 10 years. My wife and I have been in ministry now almost 30 years, almost married 30 years. And have been serving the Lord together for many years. And there's a lot of stuff that we still have yet to learn that we need to know. And there's something new that happens all the time. From whether it's coming home from 
a church and not seeing a young person, not at this particular church, but where we had served as youth pastor. And, and that young person wasn't at church that night. And we were concerned the siblings were where they are, where, where is he at, and getting home and finding out this young man had taken his life. Or coming to church and finding out some of our folks in church had been in a fatal car accident or being at the hospital with someone when they are learning that they just got the fatal diagnosis, this thing that, you know, this is something that um, is, is going to eventually take your life or being with a family at the funeral home when they've got this baby, uh, no larger, just putting the baby in your hands that was born uh, stillborn or that survived hours and having to go with that family to to bury that child and to whatever it is three in the morning to Atlanta to mullet guy in Jasper and all in between there's one thing that I mean I, I can say with supreme confidence and at the same time um, no totally be true it's exciting to serve the Lord and you don't really know what tomorrow holds as it relates to working with people to just being there when when you put yourself in a position to want to help to serve the Lord to say God I'm willing I surrender then the Lord begins to just open up doors not of like hey here's this big platform and here's all these people and here's all this money and here's all this stuff uh, no he opens up the doors to mullet guy and to breaking down in Jasper and to Atlanta and to many of the ones through the years that God has helped us to be a blessing to and they in turn have been a blessing to us same here at our church and as I reflected on that this week I was just going through my notes and looking back and again I've never done this because I'm, I'm pretty systematic in how we try to tackle the scripture I want to honor the Lord as we open the word this is the most I've talked about anything in my life in a long time with y'all um, because I want the scripture church is about the Lord it's not about us it's not about a preacher it's not about anyone else but just to give you that context I want to give you three what I believe are critical breakdowns and I'm I'm looking at my notes right here from I had to transcribe it actually last night when I finally got back from the hospital and I tried my best here they are I usually type all my stuff out I can't even read what I wrote. I was, I was so tired and I had some, some coffee. But it's, it's something when the Lord teaches you a lesson, in, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but I would say in a negative way or a positive way. But when the Lord teaches us a lesson, he takes us down a dark road or we are sitting on the side of the road, broke down. Maybe it might be physically with our bodies. Maybe it's emotionally. We are totally spent. The tank is empty. And we're having a moment. You know what I'm talking about? You, you see the, sometimes the kids on, on the soccer field, even sometimes the adults on the soccer field, they, you touch them in, in the pros. You touch them and they, oh, my, and it's like they're dead. And then they're up jumping around running uh, the next minute. I'm like, oh, my goodness. They're having a moment, right? They're having a moment. Well, maybe there, it's a breakdown physically where there's something in your life with finances, with your vehicle, with your home, with something that is dealing with you has really broken down. Maybe it's a marriage or a personal relationship with your parents or with your child, uh, with a neighbor, with a former friend, uh, a family member, and there's been some kind of a breakdown. Maybe it is, it is emotional. There's something that is really just shattered in you and you're just, you're kind of trying to hold all the pieces together. When, when I, one of the times that I came back in last night, um, Mary Poppins was, was on the TV for whatever reason. I don't know why, but I, I've never really seen the, thought about the same. But in, and I'm walking by and I see that the dad had ripped up all the note that the kids had said, we want a nanny to come and take care of us. And he ripped it up and I guess put it in the, in the fireplace and it went up. And here's uh, Mary Poppins standing with this list of things that the kids written and it's all kind of put together, this piece. Sometimes we look at our life we've got everything planned out in a certain way and then not that we write the script but we we're planners i want to maybe retire at this age i want to graduate with this gpa i want to make this team i want to play this position i want to marry 
maybe in your mind, this person, and we've been together for a while. I, I'm going to work in this job. I want to live in this town or state. I want to drive this car. I want to have this kind of house. Heck, I want a front porch. If you drive by my house, it, I have a sidewalk going into my house that you can put a broom and a welcome sign and a welcome at, and that's, it's not a front porch. And if I put three chairs there, no way. I, I want a front porch. That's what I would like to have. So I can just look at people as they drive by. But we don't always get what we want, but all of us have things planned out. And then all of a sudden God says, let's change this a little bit. And to us, what might be a breakdown, and I'm not trying to be cute with any of this, but literally what we look at as a breakdown of the road of life, God sometimes has to put us in a place where we have to slow down, where we have to stop, where we have to just kind of evaluate what is going on in my life. What is it that God is trying to teach me? And I'll tell you, backing up from going to Mr. Mullet and Jasper and, and all of that, it had been a rough day. I still remember that day, that Wednesday, talking to my professor. I mean, it was, it was tough. There were some things going on in my life, and I've been talking to my professor about it, and Brother Schaefer's in his 80s, lives in, right outside of Kingsport, Tennessee, a man of God, a wonderful man of God, one of my mentors. And I mean, it was a rough afternoon, and then I got in that car almost like 20 years old, feeling that emotion, um, like, Lord, wh wh why am I here? What, what, what is, what's the plan? What, you know, I'm hurt. I'm broken. I'm feeling let down. I wasn't complaining, but it, from Jacksonville to Valdosta, it's a little bit of a drive. So in all of that time, I was talking to the Lord as best as I could, and then, boom, the breakdown happened. And I'm so thankful for that because it really helped me to put what God wanted for me in perspective. Because what I want for me sometimes I think is best. What we want for ourselves, we, we want X, Y, and Z, but we have to evaluate, like we said last week, we have to have the plumb line of God's word to say, what does God want? Let me just give you these three things. Number one, what is the first critical breakdown on the road of life? I wrote this uh, all these years ago. Number one, is a Christian warned about his sin and thinks nothing will happen. I'll just fix it myself. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would. Let me see the verses that I have here. Turn to Proverbs 28, 13. Proverbs 28, 13, if you would. So the first breakdown is a Christian who is warned about his or her sin, but thinks, hey, nothing's going to happen. I'm going to ignore it, or I'm just going to fix it myself. Proverbs 28, 13. What I want to look at these three breakdowns is a Christian is a, a saved person, a lost person, and then a broken person. Uh, which a saved or lost person can be. What does Proverbs 28, 13 say? He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Solomon, who is, we won't say he's notorious for this, but he committed some great sin in that he, his heart went away from God. He was a womanizer. He was an alcoholic. Um, he was the most wealthy man in the day that he lived would measure up to the, to the Elon Musks of the world today. Uh, but he had any woman that he wanted, anything that he wanted, any home he wanted, and nothing, as you read Ecclesiastes, he said, everything in my life is vanity. It, can I say this in church? He said, it sucks. It's terrible. I don't like it. Everything in life is miserable. I hate it. And he has everything. And we think from this perspective, if I could just get a little piece of the pie, if I could just have something or that job or if that person or um, this time or whatever it might be. But Solomon is saying here, if you cover your sins, you won't succeed. That's what the word prosper means. You won't go very far. You'll go far. You'll, you'll get to a point. But if it's covered like I did with that black tape, uh, which I had done um, and then broke down again on because I, I, I've forgotten about it. When we try to cover things our own way and do things in our own power, our own strength with our own mind and not do it God's way, if we just cover our own sin without confessing it to God, we're not going to succeed. We're not going to prosper. Um, Paul writes in 2 Timothy, and I'll just quote this verse, chapter 4, verse 2. He says that we should preach the word. We should exhort. We should give the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. He's saying, when you see something 
Now, he's talking to Timothy about the church. But as a parent, if it might be cute when they're three and they're out there in the driveway and there's mud pies and they're making their mud pies and, oh, this is really neat, and they're playing and they're covered in mud and making mud pies. And, I mean, I can't imagine eating a mud pie. It doesn't sound appealing at all, but it might sound cute. But there are things you can be like, you might laugh at, look, look at them. Um, but you clean them up. You don't let them continue. And then we could say further, you, you wouldn't as a parent uh, allow that child to go in under the, the counter of the sink and find the chemicals or wherever in the garage and to play in those. You, no, stop. Paul said to Timothy, the word of God is to be used not as a battering ram or a bully pulpit, a hammer, a sword to cut people's heads off. Church is not a place where we come to beat people up or to get beat up. If that's what some churches do and they find pleasure in that, I think we've all grown up or been under places where, you know, boy, I've, it felt good to go to church today because they beat me up real good. And, and I've had people tell me, man, I just preach it harder like that. And there's a difference between just preaching hard for hard sake or preaching biblical and it, then it, the message, the Holy Spirit finds what we're dealing with. Because I don't know what you're dealing with. And I've only shared a little bit of what I've been dealing with this week. But all of us, can we say, all of us are dealing with something. Are you dealing with something this morning? Of course you are. And if you have kids, you're dealing with some things, right? A bunch of some things. And if you're dealing, if you live alone, you, you're dealing with yourself. You're dealing with the thoughts of all the things that you have to go through. If you're dealing with your siblings, you're dealing with a job, you're dealing with the bills, you're dealing with the stress of, <sighs> is this, am I going to make it? So the breakdown, number one, that I would say is critical is a Christian who is warned about his or her sin but thinks nothing's going to happen. I'll just ignore it. I'll fix myself. David and Bathsheba is a perfect example. David saw, you know, he lusted after a woman that was not his wife. And again, it's breaking one of the commandments of God. It's mentioned all throughout Scripture. But David was a man who loved God. He, he had a heart that went after God, but... Even men and women who have a heart after God can screw up and make some big time mistakes, right? Can we do some dumb things? Can we fall into sin? Can we make a choice to step into something that will not please God, but will please ourselves? Of course, and David did that. He lusted after a woman that was not his wife. He sent for her, and we know the rest of the story. This woman became pregnant. He wanted to cover his sin, so he tried to bring her soldier husband home and get him drunk to go home and um, be with his wife, and he refused. He was an honorable man. He loved God and loved the king. He loved his wife. An honorable man. We're going to meet Uriah in heaven one day. And it's under the blood. I mean, he's in heaven. David's in heaven, and in heaven there's... But David was warned he knew you read psalm 51 i won't take time to read it all here but psalm 51 he talks about how that god was tearing him up inside he was literally on the on, broken down on the side of the road because he knew that his sin was stopping him dead in his tracks and it wasn't until a year later that nathan the prophet came a friend but he was a preacher told him a story about a shepherd and a, a rich man and how he took one of his sheep and this this poor man only had one it was like a more of a pet and a family member than it was food and this rich man took it and killed it served it to his friends and David was ticked he was angry who is that man that man he needs to pay back and he deserves and he says you're the man David you did this you took another man's wife you lusted after her and you acted on it and you covered it up what is wrong with you and you're going to be in big trouble. The sword's not going to depart from your house for what you've done. It's going to affect you. It's going to affect your kids. It's going to affect your wife. It's going to affect your family and their future. And it, it did. It tore his family apart because of his choice to lust after and then to go after another man's wife. Here's a Christian, a, a believer, who knew about a sin, but he thought, nothing's going to happen. I'll fix it myself. This is why in the New Testament it says, to examine yourself, to work out your own salvation. Look at who you are, where you are, and what you have. If you have Sunday morning religion, let me know how that works out for you because you're going to need it again next Sunday morning. It's not going to go very far. It won't go till 2 o'clock today. I doubt it. It'll probably 
go out when someone cuts you off in traffic out here. And they will on 21. Trust me. You know it. I know it. It's crazy. It's like Atlanta out there. Um, you'll lose your Christianity just like that. Examine yourself, not your neighbor, not your kids, not your parents, not your friends. Look at yourself in the mirror of God's Word and say, am I a Christian who is measuring up to God's standard or I'm, am I covering something up? And that's the problem with porn. And that, that's the problem with pornography. That's the problem with this epidemic in our country that all kinds of things, whether it be uh, pornography or it be certain drugs that are legal to be consumed or things that are that even the culture puts a stamp of approval on that they say this is good and it's okay because there are a lot of things done under the guise of darkness that God sees that God knows and and men especially got to be careful that what you're looking at and what you're viewing what you're thinking about what's going in through your eyes and into your heart is something that is is filtered through the Word of God. And if all we have is a Sunday morning relationship with the church and with the Lord, Jesus don't live at this church. Trust me, I've been in here at 2 in the morning sometimes. It's kind of scary in here. Jesus ain't in here. Um, he's within your heart. I mean, He goes with us. The Holy Spirit guides us. The Word of God is truth. But this building can't save you. That baptistry, we talk about this all the time. You need to know, if, if you know Christ, and if you do and you are covering your sins thinking that I'm going to get away with this, it's not going to happen. Uh, the Bible truly tells us that we have to come under what God says in His Word. One last verse, Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. Jesus is speaking in Matthew chapter 7. He's talking to the Pharisees, to the religious people. And this is what He said, Many will say to me in that day, when they die and they stand before God, Many will say to me in that day, hey, you know us, we're family. We've done all this great stuff. And he says, I don't even know you. I, I don't know who you are. Depart from me. He said, many are under the, the, the guise of deception thinking that what they're doing is something that's going to get them to heaven. And they're self-deceived. So, the breakdown that I see, first of all, is for Christians. If you're a Christian and you're driving your vehicle on the road of life, whatever analogy we can go far with this, if you, if you are driving in the Christian life and you have broken down the side of the road and it's because you have covered your sin, you have tried to put some black tape on something, you've tried to replace something else that shouldn't be there, it might get you a little far. You might go, I don't know how far you can go on a donut tire, uh, the, those spare things. I don't think you can drive them for a long period of time before you're going to have a big problem. And eventually it's going to go and you might go with it. But there are a lot of Christians that think, well, I'll just, I'll get by. I'll, I'll do my best. I'll try to cover what I need to. And you know, the Lord knows. And I'm going to tell you, you're among friends because this church is filled with all of us sinners who have tried to cover our own messes. We've tried to fix things ourselves. We all do that. People on the platform, people in the choir, definitely people in the choir, all these people up here. Uh, any, all of us, every church around here, people not in church. Politicians do it, but so do Christians. They cover everything, right? David did it. And Jesus is the one when our guilt, our past, our pain, our problems weigh us down. Jesus is the one that calls off the dogs, when the religious crowd or the world or my past or my guilt says, this guy, he's, he's a piece of work. Um, Jesus said, let him without sin cast the first stone. And Jesus, the only rightful one to judge, turns and says, neither do I condemn you. You know, listen, I know who you are. I can see right through this. I know what's going on in your life. You're trying to cover this stuff. Listen, I can see through that. Now, what are you going to do about it? And that's the question for Christians. We need to determine if we're going to be broken down on the side of the road, we've got to do it God's way. So breakdown number one, a Christian warned about his or her sin but thinks nothing will happen. He or she ignores it and tries to fix it himself. Number two, um, what is breakdown number two? This is a sinner who knows his or her condition and they're warned but they put off the solution or the remedy. Um, why did Jesus come? 
Luke chapter 5, verse 32 says this. Jesus says, I came not to call the righteous. So the people who know God, he said, I didn't come to call them because they know who I am. I came to call sinners to repentance. I came to call the people who are broke, who are dirty, who are hurting, those who maybe don't even know those things about themselves. I called, I came to call them. Isaiah 55 says this, verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. So here, Isaiah is saying, we need to go and seek after the Lord, even though there's none that seek after him. But when we are broken down on the side of the road, if you're a sinner and someone has told you, you need Jesus, I know that's a big slogan. And trust me, in Washington, we need bumper stickers. You, you saw the debate. You, you, listen, you live here. You know what I'm talking about. You live in America. We need Jesus in America. And not just in a general sense, but in a personal sense. Each one of us, we need Jesus. And if you have never acknowledged your need for Jesus, the only the help that he can give you, there's nothing, no amount of good works, having kissing the Pope's toe or whatever that is, or coming up here and getting holy water or meeting Brother Mullet and Jasper or myself. It doesn't matter how far you go, how many religious exercises you go through. If you don't acknowledge your need for the Lord and salvation, then what he's done for you will never matter. It will never be applied because you're like, listen, I got time, plenty of time. The remedy, it's all good. You, you've been warned. Isaiah says, seek the Lord while he may be found, which implies there's a day when you will go to the Lord. In fact, he says, they will knock and I will not answer. They will call and I will not hear. There'll come a day when people who have been told about the Lord have been warned about the judgment of God. The door is going to close and God's going to say, ah, it's enough. You say, well, when is that day coming? I don't know when that is, but why would we live on the edge like that? So this breakdown here is don't put off 2 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Today is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Now. In college, uh, I had a bus route. My bus route first was on Cecil Field. Um, and I had two guys, Andrew, who was in Germany now, uh, he and his wife. He was uh, um, in the Navy. So, and then Bernard, Sylvia, and he's actually in the islands. So, oh, Bernard, yeah, you remember Bernard and Andrew, Les. Um, so I would go with them uh, to, to Cecil Field when it was, the base was there and get to go on and we'd pick up kids for church and talk to them. And then Andrew and Bernard graduated and then I had a bus route with my roommate in college and we grew up together, Brian. He's actually still a youth pastor at my home church in Walkertown, North Carolina. And we had 103rd. Now back in the day, many of you know, because I was in Jacksonville from 92 to 96 and then we would visit. Um, but I still remember, like many of you, I mean, Cecil Field being up there, and then you're on 103rd, and you go for a certain point, and it's from like the four or six lanes, and it goes down to two, and there's trailer parks. And there's places back there, behavioral centers, there was a couple of places where this one was, and we called the nickname this guy, the Apostle Paul, because we go to visit him, Brian and I, um, he had two little girls that would come, he let come on the bus route. And when we go to visit him, we go to visit them, and we'd visit our kids on Saturday. Um, he'd be out there. It was the mullet. I still see him. I mean, he was, like, super tan. He was an older guy. He had the mullet kind of balding up here. And he'd be out there without a shirt on and, and his shorts and his flip-flops. And there was always a big fire. I, that always intrigued me because I'm like, man, it's hot. And when we would go visiting, the college would make us wear a tie with the humidity in Florida to go outside. And I'm like, this is so wrong. If this is purgatory. This is because we were sweating. But we would go out. We'd have our short sleeve shirts on. We'd have our Bible. We'd go with our bus flyers, inviting kids to church. Uh, but there was this guy. His name was Paul. That's what we nicknamed Pastor Paul. And he'd always have a fire. I remember the last time I saw him, um, and we went on a Thursday night. And he had the big fire out there. And we were out there. Just, we would always talk to him about being saved. We let his girls come to church, let them ride the bus. We would bring them to Sunday school, bring them to kids' church. And he, uh, he would always just talk about, one, why he had plenty of time and why really it didn't matter. How can we ever know? 
And I always, I still remember, and when we moved back here, and, and in fact, when I came down for Brother Osteen's funeral, when I, when, before our family moved here, it was February of that year, when I came down for Brother Osteen's funeral, and I flew in by myself, um, I, I flew into Orlando, no, it was Daytona, I drove up through my old bus route. I could still, I could take you on that today. I could take you to every house. Every time I go up that way to visit the hospital, I will cut through and just go th some of those same streets where we picked up those kids. Know all their names, still remember their names, have them written down. But that guy, even in my notes here, we try to talk to him about the Lord. And, it, and I remember when I came back in the early 2000s when my brother graduated from Bible college, went by there and he had died. I don't know if he ever trusts the Lord, but I remember the conversations we had. And he was like, oh, I got plenty of time. It's not even real probably, but we would be so firm. We were 18, 19, 20 years old. Paul, you need to get saved. You need to know the Lord. Your daughters want you to be saved. We want you to be saved. I mean, plenty of time living his life. And maybe in your own life, you identify with that guy because you're like, I got plenty of time. But one day there will come a point in your life where there will be that breakdown in the room. Maybe the breakdown will be something that God can say, I'm trying to get your attention. I'm trying to get your attention. You need to look up. I've been trying to tell you there's hope. I love you. And here's the remedy. You need to be saved. Again, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Why will you put it off? So breakdown one, a Christian who's been warned about a sin says, ah, I'll fix it myself, whatever. Breakdown two that I saw was that it's a sinner who's also been warned about judgment and a sin. He's like, don't worry about it. Plenty of time. Final, number three. Number three breakdown I think is critical is broken things that are thrown out or discarded by the world but are useful and beautiful to God. I grew up in the era, as many of you did, with Fred Sanford. Hear that, Elizabeth? I'm coming to join you, honey. And I got big dummy back here with me. You know what I'm saying? Some of you get it. Some of, I don't know if we can say that in the pulpit or not, but uh, we just did. But I grew up, you know, one man's trash is another man's treasure. I don't know. You drive around. Now we have Facebook to tell us where everybody puts their junk out on the curb. Hey, I'm taking a picture here. Come by and pick it up. And Eve dumpster diving is a thing with a lot of people. So whatever. But, you know, it's, it is crazy, the things that we buy years ago that cost us a pretty penny, and then over time it loses its value, sentimentality. It loses its worth in our eyes, maybe even its own worth, a home, a, a, a nightstand, a, a TV, whatever. People put those things out there, and one man's trash, you put it on the curb, and it's gone. Some of you have done that. You've put things on the curb, and then the next morning you're like, they weren't going to pick that up. I'm glad it's gone. Or maybe you've been the one that has picked the things up and it's in your house now and you've worked on it, whatever. But broken things, the breakdown number three that I see is broken things that are thrown out or discarded by the world but are used and beautiful to God. Let's just, let's not be hypocritical about this and just think that it's the church or Christians or people who claim the name of Christ that mistreat people. Those Christians do. People who name the name of Christ do, and, and churches do. Sometimes people in church can, you know, it's this air of past the other side of the street. Oh, my goodness. And we see that with the story of the Good Samaritan. The guy's in the ditch. He's bleeding. He's bloody. He's half naked. He needs help. And the religious people walk over and like, oh, my goodness. I'm going over there and walking the other side. The other guy came up and looked at him. was like, oh, he's in bad shape. Uh, I'm praying for you. Uh, see you. And... Sometimes we, as believers, a church, we give a terrible name to Christ by how we treat people. We just throw them out. But what I see here, what we see in God's Word, is that God uses broken things. Aren't you thankful for that? God uses broken things. I got home last night late uh, before I had to go back out again. Um, and I'll just use this because I have a teenage daughter. Her glasses were broke for some reason. And those things are so irritating. Not teenage daughters, uh, but uh, glasses. Okay, I'm just, see, so you're waiting for me to go there. Um, and it's that little tiny little screw. Oh, my goodness. And it was like I, I heard them out there talking about fixing it. And, and I wear glasses, and Allie and I are the only ones in our family. And I'm like, 
let an expert help you here. And I, I said, bring it to me. I'm in there trying to, I'm writing stuff down, preparing for today. Um, and they bring it in. I'm looking at the screw. I'm like, oh my goodness. And we don't have any of the tiny screwdrivers. We don't have any of it. She doesn't have any of that stuff. And I, it's all here at the church. I'm like, oh my goodness. I'm like, do we have any uh, sticky tack, which is what we use to put things up for VBS? I'm going to MacGyver this. Let's, let's, let's work on this for a second until we can get it. I need a case. Give me a case. Do we, give me a Pepsi. Do we have? No, I'm just kidding. That was just for me. Give, me. give me your glasses case, which she didn't have, so we use mine. Give me the, the sticky tack and the screw. And even with tweezers, you know, you can't do anything with that. So I'm like, I got it to where I could. I got the screw on it, the sticky tack. And I just ran up to the church last night in my pajamas um, for that period. So if you saw me out... I, I was in my sane mind, but I was here in my pajamas, not the first time. Then I went in there, just got it, and with the sticky stuff, just went through, and there it was, fixed it. And, of course, I came back in. The trumpets were sounding. I was like, yes, Dad is here, and tears. I mean, they were like, oh, we're not worthy, you know, like, of course, uh, I fixed this. It's good. Let's go. Um, simple foolish illustration many of you as moms dads young people whatever you fix things in your house that probably other people would throw away or you've thrown things away that other people might fix and we just don't have the time to deal with it here's the great thing god is not afraid of broken things god doesn't turn his back on people who are broken or that are um, that are facing brokenness and, and the neat thing is, which is also very sad, um, what we see on here with any social media, whether all the platforms, Snapchat, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatever, um, all of them, nobody really puts their brokenness on here. Some do, and maybe you're, it confuses us, like hmm, they must be having a hard time. When someone lets you into their life a little bit through here, you, you may be like, hmm, something, what's going on? But most of the time, we don't put our broken pieces on social media. We put our best pieces on social media. But God uses broken things. Uh, two examples, and I won't read it. Second Samuel chapter 9, uh, David's best friend. David becomes the king, as we know. David wants to show kindness to his best friend who died in battle and his father. He wants to do something kind for them. He gets to the palace and he says, how can I honor my best friend? I made a promise. If I died, he'd take care of my kids. If he died, I'd take care of his. And his servant said, 2 Samuel chapter 9, there is one, but he's a cripple. He's not walked a day in his life. And he lives in the ghetto in the projects. And this kid is, you know, he says, get the chariot, go get him. And when they brought this kid, Mephibosheth was his name, um, when, in fact, his mother, the handmaid, dropped him. His dad was dead. His grandfather was dead. The kingdom was about to fall. And they were trying to escape from the enemy. And she fell with this infant, crushed his legs. He never walked a day in his life. So because of something that he had nothing to do with, now here he is. The, he was the prince. He was an heir to the throne. But as I've heard Dr. Seitler, who is my home pastor, say, it was the grace of God. The grace of God through David, who sat on the throne, who Jesus would come through that line. He said, is there anyone that I can show kindness to? And he brought Mephibosheth. When that crippled kid was laid at his feet in the throne room, he said, um, what have you to do with a dead dog like me? He says, I'm a dog. I'm nothing. He says, no, no. <clears throat> this is the grace of God. I made a promise. And that really signifies that here is God. He, he knows where we live. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows what we're facing. He knows how bad it is with our bank account or our marriage or our kids or our job or whatever. Our emotional state, we're just like struggling to survive and we've had 15 cups of coffee, right? We're just trying to do our best. But God knows where we are. He understands what we're dealing with. He just say, leave him there. He says, get him. You're my son. You're going to sit at my table. We're going to work your field. We're going to give you a new home. You've got a new life because now you live in the palace. And that is the grace of God. God uses broken things. 
In Matthew 15, it's the same way. There's a woman that says, my daughter is very sick. In fact, she's possessed by demons and she was uh, a Gentile. And Jesus said, I'm not, I didn't come to the Gentiles. He said, he wasn't being racist. He wasn't being um, like, I don't like these people. He says, I came to the house of Israel. I'm coming to help them. She says, Master, please, if only you would. He says, it's not meat for me. It's not right for me to give food to the dogs. Sounds pretty tough. And she says, but Lord, you are the Christ. Even the dogs get the crumbs. And I love that. And he said to that woman, Matthew chapter 15, you can read that. Verse number 28, he says, there's not so great faith in Israel. Here's a woman who had been pushed down her whole life, and now her daughter's so sick. and got some, so many health issues. And she said, I just, I don't even want what's on the table. Just give me the crumbs, the scraps. You know, and the Lord touched this woman and this lady's life and said, this woman has such great faith. You know, when we're broken, we don't think straight. When we're broken down, we get impatient. We're, it's unexpected. It's not in our time frame, we have to wait. We're, we're, things are going through our mind. What's this going to cost? Uh, can I fix this myself? What am I doing here? When am I going to get to where I got to go? Oh my goodness. And so often in our own lives, this is not what we wrote. This is not what we planned. And yet God in his sovereignty, he knows exactly where you are right now, what you're dealing with. I mean, brother Rob, I mean, we, we talked about this just a couple weeks ago. I mean, we sat in your living room and cried about it. I remember, um, goodness, so many different saints of God in our church through the years, even, you know, in past churches where you're dealing with folks that they, their marriage has fallen apart or the kid has run away or someone has died or they've lost their job or they're moving. And I, and I hate all of those things. Because we, we want to fix things. We're fixers. We're, Macgy- we're all MacGyvers. Bring me some silly putty. Bring me a Pepsi. Bring, bring me a screwdriver. Bring me a flashlight. Bring me... We, we like to fix things. And God is a fixer. But God doesn't just throw the trash out, so to speak. You ain't trash. The world might say that if you don't look their way. They may say that if you don't buy their stuff, if you don't listen to their stuff, if you don't walk their way or act their way, but you ain't trash. God does not create trash. And God treasures you. He loves you. He cares about you. I'll close with this. I've never even talked about Ray. This Ray Simmons, when I was growing up in our church, Ray was, I don't, I can't, I don't even know the one name of his particular health issue but Claire you remember Ray Ray stood about this tall and uh, he he walked uh, one leg was shorter than the other one he had one shoe had to help lift him up he walked with a limp he had I mean if if you have seen the hunchback of Notre Dame or Notre Dame however you pronounce it if you've seen that movie that was Ray I mean because he had like his spine the way it was curved it literally came out like this and he walked and he came on our buses, and he was a grown man. And Ray was at church every service. He was there all the time. Come Wednesday night, to come Sunday night. He was, and Ray would have his Bible. Um, I remember as a teenager just watching him. Now, the church I grew up in is a church of 5,000 people. You're, it's a, uh, where our pastor built the church. It was on an old tobacco field, so you've got a ton of acres so you're walking across these buildings to get to these places and here's Ray carrying his Bible and I just just even in my notes looking back talking about him this you would look at him or someone like him and think wow what like the disciples did this man is blind who sinned him or his parents why is God punishing him you know we look at people and like what 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 happened? What's wrong with you? But God looks at people and he says, I've got a plan. And when we look at people through God's eyes, we look at situations through God's eyes, whether you're going to meet Mr. Mullet and Jasper, 
God bless you on that one. Every time I drive up 75, I look out there. I've stopped at that exit. It's not that anymore, but I just reflect on that. And I'm like, man, this is, you know, we have to have those markers in our life where we have broken down, where we can see, despite our breakdown, we see the faithfulness of God. And I don't want to say a breakdown or a breakthrough because, no. Because sometimes that's a long way off. Just get up, dust yourself off, and get going. You're among friends. We all have to do that. We had to do that today. We have to do that tomorrow. You might have to do that as soon as you leave here. You're going back into something. But God has a plan for your life. He cares deeply about you. And we at this church, and you know, I can't speak for everyone, but I know we've been here 10 years. I know that people here, none of us are perfect. We've all been on the side of the road. But we'll be the ones, you call the Lord first, he's the only one that can help you, but there's going to be a group of people that come out there with you in the tow truck, let's go, let's do this. Because we've all been there. You're among friends. So where are you today? Saint, who's covering things? Sinner, who's putting off? Or you're just broken. You're saved or you're a sinner. Because broken people, if you come to Christ, you still can be broken it, life is not perfect. Save people get cancer. Save people have divorce. Save people have their kids go sideways. Sometimes things happen. Save people lose their money. Save people lose their homes. It doesn't matter if, if all that. It's what God does to us and through us when we break down. Only Jesus can help you. And we're here to say that this morning. Let's pray. God bless you. You're dismissed.